not so long ago. Human beings lived in perfect harmony with nature. They would only take what they needed to live, even if Mother Nature was sometimes unkind. This could have lasted forever, but our civilization came, and almost all those populations have now disappeared. Desertification, genocide, assimilation, exile threaten those who are a vital part of mankind's collective memory. We have much to learn from them. Our own survival may well depend upon it. They are willing to teach us, but time is running short, for they are endangered civilizations. At an altitude of more than 11,000 feet in a lost corner of the Himalayas, religious fervor is the ultimate mortar binding the people. beliefs may appear complicated to you, they are in fact simple. Our country is the meeting point between the forces of good and evil, the gods and the spirits. They all protect us. My name is Sonam. I'm a teacher and a member of my village's folklore group. Our country's customs are thousands of years old. I want to keep them alive. At one time, we used to buy salt, pelts, and jewels in Tibet and sell them to our cousins in present-day Pakistan. In 1947, India was cut in two. The border closed. We can't sell in the West anymore. In 1952, China crushed Tibet. We could no longer buy in the East. So what's left today? A road to the south, to Islamic Kashmir. Ladakh can be summed up in a few words, 100,000 square kilometers for 100,000 people. Here, anything taken from the earth is a heaven-sent gift, a considerable achievement for the inhabitants and a promise of survival during the long, hard winter. remote three times over. In winter, the country is isolated from the rest of the world by passes that are nearly 16,000 feet high. For eight months of the year, the only road is blocked by snow. Islam and communism hover at our borders, threatening our way of life. School finishes today. It marks the advent of spring. My niece, Dede, is 12. The journey home for her is no less than several days' walk. Dede is going home to see her parents for the first time in six months. Her village is nearly three days' walk away, so she stays in town during the winter. Going to school in Ladakh is an almost unheard of bit of luck. Okay. I'll give one example. As the pupils are very mixed, Dede sometimes follows courses in English, sometimes in Ladakhi. It's not very easy for her. Correct. Sit down, please. Please, hands up. Who can tell me? Yes, please. Correct. 
Uncle Sonam is going back to the village with me. He's also going to lend the family a hand during the spring months. The village is quite far away and more than 15,000 feet up. The capital city of Leh was once a great market and people came from far away to trade. Then the borders were closed. Now the daily market is much smaller. You can find the basics, but not much else. Sonam has bought a big pack to fill with supplies. Many things you can't get higher up, so everyone in my village is taking advantage of our being in town. Lordy. We can't go home without making a stop at the monastery. The road may be hazardous, but we must pay tribute and make offerings to Buddha. He guides our steps. Inside the monastery, Buddha always stays in your mind. His life is an example for us to follow. Buddha isn't a god for us, he's more like a guide, a model for life. We have three days of hiking to climb to 14 and a half thousand feet across the permanent snow, the ice and the shingle before reaching home. The scenery is wonderful, but a little barren. This is the last village before the upper mountains. You can recognize it by the stone walls that are lined with yak skulls. They're all engraved with holy sayings that protect the village. The Chaltans protect the village from the influence of the spirits. They look like Buddha sitting cross-legged. Each floor is a part of his body and represent his philosophy.
there's still some grain in stock. The last harvest must have been extremely good. Barley flour, called sampa, is what gets us through the winter. We add it to soups, barley beer, everything practically. <laughs> Tonight we're staying at Lamo's, a friend. She has two husbands because her husband's brother couldn't find a wife. So now they live in one big family and the land doesn't get too divided up. Lamo's uncle hasn't been very lucky. Five of his six children have gone to live in town. He's got no one to help him with the work, and his fields are falling into the river. About a hundred people have gathered for a wedding. A hundred people. In this area, that's a pretty big event. A special occasion to meet and have fun. The married women put on their turquoise headdresses, which are by far their most precious possessions. Mountain traditions don't disappear easily. The frozen river. This carpet of ice is the only link between the capital and the village. To get to it, you can't walk along the banks. It would be even slower and more difficult. The moving ice is the only feasible way, despite the cold and the danger of breaking through the surface. We have to stop to put on warmer, more comfortable clothes. Sonam has planned everything. Tonight the temperature will drop to 20 degrees below zero. Sonam always carries with him a holy book of prayers. In this region, the old Ladakis often see a divine nature in everything around them. Earlier on, when I struck the ice with my staff, it sounded hollow. It's wiser to walk along the cliff. The only trouble is that it's steep here and rocks can fall at any time. skin slippers are very warm but also very slippery. Sonam is completely stuck.
The deeper we go into the mountains, the more we pay our respects to the spirits of the sky, the land, and the underworld. To please the Lus and the Lars, Sonam offers a drop of tea to each of them. In Ladakh, especially in the upper mountains, the summits are said to shelter imaginary beings. Red sands with two faces, flying witches, ogres and dwarves. And since such creatures wake up when night falls, it's time to find shelter and light a warming, comforting fire to keep away the wolves and the spirits and the snow leopards. We rest around the warm fire for a few hours. In moments such as these, we think about Buddha and his worthiest representative, the Dalai Lama. Monks dedicate their lives to the monastery. Some give themselves body and soul to their religion. Others live there for a time before returning to everyday life. They have to obey strict rules. They pray several times a day. They take part in maintaining the monastery. They live on the charity of the faithful and study the holy scriptures until their deepest meaning is revealed. Nonetheless, some monks are born with great learning. They are the living reincarnation of deceased monks, of lamas who've returned to our world for a new life. Whether adults or children, those who are called the tulku are the object of unqualified veneration. Their blessing is a rare privilege. This immense landscape, we must remain confident, yet careful. In this country, we don't admire nature so much as fear it. In winter, animals too suffer the harsh conditions of this barren region. Left on their own in October, they're herded together again in April if they're still alive. In Ladakh, we recite poems as old as the mountains. They say that winter is a conch because it's a rare shell as white as the snow. They say that the spring is silver because the snow melts and captures the sparkling light. They say that the summer is turquoise because everything turns green like the precious stone in the region. And they say that the autumn is gold like the harvest and the sunshine on the ripe crops. months of the year, snow covers the upper valleys, leaving precious little time to work the land and grow enough food to survive the winter.
The isolation and cold may be hard, but at least outsiders have never come to disturb our way of life. It's been the same for thousands of years. Our roots are here. The family has been waiting for us to arrive for three days. They prepared a small party for Dede. Her father wasn't too worried. Her mother is amazed to see how her daughter has changed. Our whole family is here, and the neighbors have come too. Sonam tells them about the town, all the noise and the cars. He makes it all sound very exciting. He loves telling stories. Everyone drinks lots of tea and chang, which is millet beer. We have four generations here under one roof, which is quite something in this region, considering life expectancy is about 50. The traditional doctor, the Amshi, is also at the party. Grandmother, who is 88 years old, has a quick examination. By sheer coincidence, she is suffering from every complaint under the sun. The Amshi gives her a few potions he holds the secret to, but most of all, good advice. At her age, medication can easily be a poison. Dede has gone over to the Amshi to ask him to tell her fortune, but that isn't an Amshi's job. So the old man opens what he calls the Book of Wisdom and improvises a few telling truths about her future. The men have challenged Sonam the Lucky. They sit together in the corner of the room and play a really fast game of dice while waiting for the long awaited spring. In a few days it will be spring. We'll have to get quickly to work wake up the earth and celebrate it so that the harvest will be good. Well, at least, good enough. Every spring, you have to think about the following winter. All at once, the race against time begins again. Plowing, sowing, harvesting, stocking up on the things we need during the eight months of winter. 
only four months for a harvest at 13,000 feet. Should it fail, everyone's forced to face the winter alone. A Himalayan version of the ant and the grasshopper. The weather has warmed and the snow melted. The spring may have come, but the soil is still frozen when we begin ploughing. The first furrow awakens the Lars, the earth spirits. They're the most important of all. They determine the quality of the entire harvest. The team, the Zos, must take part in our prayers. We pour Chang and barley flour libations on each part of the team and make offerings to the spirits before they're disturbed. Sonam has come to help us, and as usual, he gets a little carried away. He can't help telling everybody stories and singing old songs. At this altitude, he's going to wear himself out. He's not used to working so hard. But for now, he's still got everyone fooled. The most urgent job is sowing the barley. It takes almost an entire summer for it to ripen. We also have to sow fast-growing wheat and rape to make the oil that's so essential in winter. If the season is good, we may have time to plant vegetables after harvesting the barley. It would be exceptional, but very welcome. Girls work only rarely in the fields, a few days at the most. Their job is to gather wood, dig up brush and dry the yak dung that's very good for burning. The wind and rivers tend to sweep away most of the wood. There's not enough wood anywhere, even though people only chop down what they absolutely need. In winter, the snow comes right up and around the house. But in summer, water is a problem because the house is far from the river. There's no choice. We just have to carry it up. <laughs> At the end of the day, Sonam organizes a picnic. It's not part of the tradition. He's worn out. But not even that keeps him from singing some song or another. In the evenings, the boys play at Karam, 
It's like billiards without a ball. The one who gets the last token in wins the kitty. We girls barely have the right to watch. No surprises tonight. Mum is fixing the basic dish. Sample pancakes that she cuts up and puts in the cabbage soup with little bits of chicken. And the whole thing is washed down with salted butter tea with a little sampa. It's very good and very nourishing. <laughs> Sonam is completely tired out. He's explaining to Papa Ritzeng that the ground is really hard and dry. He thinks it's pretty funny. Ritzeng is making fun of me. He's older than I am, and he does this kind of work every day. The land is fertile, it's true, but it's very dry. It rains less and less. Each year, the fields are eroded by the melting snow. They're getting gradually smaller. There's no longer enough to feed the family. And there's certainly no longer a surplus to sell. So the children have to leave. But it's hard for them to know what to do. Karma isn't happy. He has looked everywhere for work, but he has no training. He can't speak either the Urdu of the Kashmiris or Hindi very well, so no one wants him. Sonam tries to help him. He advises him to go to Speedy province where they speak our language. Maybe find work in tourism and be a driver. But Karma wants to remain in Ladakh. And Pa Ritzeng says that when Karma returns to the house, he doesn't know how to do anything. Karma is right. There are no jobs, because in summer the Kashmiris come to Ladakh and take all the good ones. They run businesses, they control tourism, then leave again just before winter. Sonam thinks that tourism is the only possibility. But when people leave, the family is weaker and there isn't anybody to do the farming. Sonam is leaving. He must now return to the town and do his job again. He is going to try to find a lorry to get down to the monastery. I'm staying with my parents until the end of the summer. We always miss him, Sonam the lucky, Sonam the boaster. Still higher up in the mountains in summer, you come across those who have suffered most from the closing of the borders, the nomads, the caravanners. They used to cross the high passes to get to the lower reaches of the Indus, where they would sell Ladakhi products, which earned the region money. Today, the borders are closed. Like these nomads, Ladakh has entered into a great sadness. It's no use looking for the dozens of yaks they used to own for the transport. They served no further purpose, so the nomads let them die of old age. You don't kill when you're a true believer. The nomads still travel through the upper valleys, but they've become no more than ordinary shepherds. 
goats and sheep have replaced the dzos. The people live from spinning and weaving. They also make cheese, the strict minimum for not having to become sedentary. And thus, they maintain the rhythm of their former life. Everything in the valley is green now, Ladakh in all its beauty. Who would believe that this country lies practically inert for eight months of the year? At this time of the year, water is plentiful, and this time it doesn't carry off the soil, it irrigates the fields. The brooks have been channeled to irrigate the crops as best as possible. In the village, each person can reroute the course of a brook to water his fields, but he also has to close the small locks so the others can use it too. Everything grows in miniature because of the lack of sun. One just has to make do with thumb-sized apricots and wheat knee-high to a grasshopper and apples you can pop down in one gulp. The sense of community is very strong and important here. People help one another during harvesting because the harvest waits for no man. The Lama, Sota, is a monastery official. He's also a friend. I want his advice on a number of questions. A monastery festival is an occasion that no one in the area wants to miss. The monks return to the monasteries they belong to, for three days, they pray and dance for peace in the region to honor the protecting spirits and demonstrate aspects of Buddha's teaching. 
Sota directs the monks who are dancing. Each wears clothes made or donated by the inhabitants of the region. But most special of all, and for the only time during the year, the dancers wear holy masks that are kept in a special room. Sota is wearing the mask of one of the most powerful protectors, Mahakala. The three-day festival is meant to show the monastery's influence on the faithful. Because the monasteries are wealthy, really wealthy, from the thousands of hectares of land put out to farm, and from all the gifts they receive. In this life, the person who gives to the monks is honored, and it stands him in good stead for his future reincarnation. So once a year, the monastery demonstrates the extent of its spiritual and temporal power. Inspired by the sound of horns and clashing cymbals, the monks enter the courtyard of the monastery. Traditionally, the festival starts, like here in Hemis, by unveiling the great Tanka, a huge old painting done by the monks themselves. The senior monks file out in procession. They supervise the whole ceremony. The great tanka is revealed, a representation of the person who introduced Buddhism to Ladakh and Tibet. It signals the beginning of the festival. The monks dance for peace in Ladakh. They all know it's under constant threat. Meanwhile, a few monks in disguise mingle with the crowd, encouraging the people to make offerings, a very secular way to ensure the monastery's future. The dance is punctuated by the drums and cymbals. Each movement symbolizes a step taken by Buddha as he moves through the land teaching the faithful. The monks revolve according to a detailed, carefully rehearsed choreography. Their gestures define the space they move in.
Each dance is a test of endurance for the monks who have to control every movement for more than an hour. Fatigue is not long in coming. The warmth and weight of the costumes are suffocating and it's a relief for them to be able to take a short rest as they change costumes for the next dance. Between the performances, other young monks move among the faithful, encouraging them to make offerings. Many are willing to uphold this strong tradition, writing down their names and the amount they wish to give to the monastery. Collecting funds is a constant concern. <laughs> Sotar agrees to receive me during the festival. This is a great honor. I've got lots to ask him. My first question is about the lack of rain in summer. Sotar is surprised. There's not a lot we can do, he answers. That's nature. Some wizard monks in the area claim to be able to make rain fall. Here we have no such powers. But we sent three monks into the mountains to pray for a good summer. When I tell him that many Ladakhis no longer find enough fertile land to feed their families, that erosion has become a real problem, Sota answers that if a family is in need, it's our duty to help. The monastery can lend land to a farmer in need. Then he can pay rent for the use of it. The young are leaving. Teaching in our language is disappearing. Our children are going away, yet they don't find work. They have no training. <coughs> Sota's answer surprises me. The Ladakis have forgotten that in the old days each family had to give its third child to the monastery. Young people can find work in the country's traditional professions, like weaving or the making of clothes and objects. We in the monasteries teach in Ladakhi, but the children must also learn the foreign languages that are spoken in Kashmir and India. This is essential if we are to communicate with our neighbors. But the borders are closed. The Kashmiris are invading Ladakh. They want to force their religion on us. All our neighbors are at war. There are more soldiers than Ladakhis in the region. We are foreigners in our own province. But Sotar thinks that we should pray for our neighbors. They live in great torment, for they suffer from their own desires. Our philosophy is right, he says, because it brings peace. So what must we do? Start fighting and get involved in an endless conflict? 
or leave our region in the hands of defenders with a radically different religion? Or leave, like certain of our Tibetan cousins? Or follow the teachings of Buddha? He would tell us to be patient and to stick to our principles. That time would pass and that Ladakh will live on. That's our only hope. For faith in Buddha leads to faith in oneself. <laughs>